the success of the Sturmgeschutz 3 with the L48 7.5cm cannon in destroying enemy armor, combined with a desire to reduce the types of armored chassis being constructed, led to a decision in September of 1942 to develop a new replacement vehicle based on the Panzer IV. Basically, it was going to be a Stug IV. The new vehicle was going to be developed either as Kleiner Panzerjäger or as Stug Neuer Art. Now, while the production firms started developing the process to figure out how to turn a Panzer IV-F into an SPG, a little internecine in war was going on between the inspectorates of infantry, artillery and panzer troops over just what the thing was going to be called. The panzer troops, i.e. Guderian, wanted it to be a Panzerjäger. Artillery and infantry wanted it to be a Sturmgeschutz. And the difference was more than just the name, it would also affect how the vehicle was deployed. If it was a Panzerjäger, it would go into the anti-tank companies of the Panzer regiments. If it was a Sturmgeschutz, well, the artillery would use it in support of the infantry. And given that, okay, granted, three quarters of Sturmgeschutz ammunition was going against soft targets, they were doing sterling work supporting the infantry in the anti-armor role. Well, in the end, Panzer troops won out and the vehicle was going to be described as a Panzerjäger. In 1943, a prototype vehicle came out of the Versuchsleichter Panzerjäger IV. It would eventually, of course, be known as the Jägerpanzer IV. Now, we are here in Bunster at the Panzer Museum, where we have two such vehicles. On my left-hand side is a prototype vehicle, on the right-hand side is a service vehicle. And because the service vehicle is not completely intact and it's got things like shirts in, in the way, what we're going to do in this video is we're actually going to be kind of hopping between the two vehicles and that way you'll get a better overview of what the vehicle is actually like. So that said, let's get started. Before we get going, a quick admin note on the vehicle. This was made in July of 1944, but for whatever reason, it's been backdated a little bit to look like an earlier production version. And I'll touch on those differences as we go around. Although the Waffenamt had for a while been trying to apply sloped armor to the Panzer IV, the problem was that the needs of the war were such that they couldn't really afford to stop to make a changeover. However, the development of an entirely new vehicle allowed the application of sloped armor pretty much from the beginning. Thus, the superstructure front is sloped at 50 degrees. It was originally six centimeters thick, but by about vehicle number 300 or so in May of 44, this was thickened to eight centimeters thick, and that's what this particular vehicle has. Now, one of the problems though with the Jägerpanzer IV as a whole was that it's a little bit nose heavy. And going from six centimeters to eight centimeters of frontal armor did not help that one bit. After only two months of production, a weight saving measure was that they moved the track links from the front of the vehicle to a new facility at the back. Another way of saving weight is you'll see that the corners of the mantlet shroud here have been cut off. This metal that they decided they didn't need. And you compare that to the prototype vehicle where it's nice and square. Another simplification measure was that the corners of the superstructure are no longer rounded as they were on the prototype. It just was deemed not worth the effort. And you'll see this a couple of times in German vehicle design. For example, the decision to go from the rounded turret on the Tiger II to the more square one. The plates are instead welded together in the typical German late war interlocking fashion. You'll see it as well at the front here. Just in board of the weld, you're going to see the conical shroud for the machine gun port. Now, early vehicles, they had one on both sides. There's uh, one above the driver's vision port on the prototype, for example. But very quickly, it was decided that it just was not worth the effort. It was quickly deleted. However, because the armor plate was being produced by another manufacturer to the vehicle assembly firm, in this case, Vomag, a lot of the vehicles were delivered and built with that hole on the left hand side for the no longer wanted machine gun. As a result, you will see a fair few early production vehicles have a cover where the machine gun would be, but it's actually welded in place. It's not an operable system. As you move further down on the fender would ordinarily be the shrouded headlights missing here. There are access ports on each side of the glacier plate 
for your steering and braking systems. And underneath this very thick zimmerit and paint, you can barely see evidence of the transmission cover. Uh, so obviously this not being a runner vehicle, they don't care whether or not you can access the transmission because there, there isn't one. So that's why it looks hidden, but I promise you there is a plate there. As you come further down, you're going to see that the towing mount is part of the side armor plate. This is again pretty common for late war German vehicles, again interlocked. The upper part here is sloped at 45 degrees, the lower part is sloped at 55. Another visual distinguisher of an early vehicle versus a late vehicle is the muzzle brake on the end of the gun. It was discovered that because of the way the gun was mounted to the superstructure, you didn't need it unless you were firing more than 50 rounds rapid fire. Thus, because the muzzle brake was more of a liability than a benefit, because when you fire it, it throws up dust and dirt and it A, obscures your own view and B, announces to the rest of the world where you are, by April 44 it was deleted. Vehicles that had already been delivered to the field also saw the muzzle brake removed. Now, in the unfortunate event that you did need to fire more than 50 rounds rapid fire, a new recoil cylinder was developed and installed on later production vehicles. But in the grand scheme of things, that wasn't all that important. To get at the running gear, I've come back to the prototype vehicle because it doesn't have shirts in. The other vehicle, the service one, has a sort of a fake mounted Schurzen and even the one that is mounted is of the wrong era for the month of production. I haven't actually seen anything specifically stating which vehicles had Schurzen and which didn't because it looks like even the prototype vehicles had mountings for it, so perhaps it was simply unit discretion. If you were to lift up the Schurzen on the left hand side, you're going to see the two filler ports for the fuel system, they're, they're not on the right. In the original Panzer IV, the fuel tanks were located centrally under the turret. However, because you didn't need to have room for, let's say, the power shaft to go forward, there was no need to have a raised floor. And all that was happening was keeping the fuel tanks here, you have a higher roof line on the vehicle. By moving the fuel tanks forward, it allowed the vehicle's roof to be lowered. The running gear is, well, that's typical Panzer IV. It is bogies on leaf springs, and they are asymmetrical springs. Uh, they are thicker at the front, they are thinner at the back. And if you look at the far side, they're reversed, so they're still thicker at the front. You can't take a left-hand side Panzer IV bogey and shove it on the right side. Well, maybe you could, but it's not designed to work that way. As I say, it's asymmetric, so what happens is that there is an axle here for the support bracket forward on to this wheel, which as you can see has a bump stop. Then the spring comes to the back, the rear wheel rests on the spring. And so there you have that independent uh, movement of action. As an example of the weight problem at the front of the vehicle, look at the front road wheels. There is excessive wear on the rubber. Now the initial solution was quite simply, well, if the thing's nose heavy, let's just move the hull back say 10 centimeters on the running gear. Well, there isn't room to move the hull back 10 centimeters. So what they did instead was they started replacing the lead road wheels with steel rimmed ones. Then the problem got even worse when you put the L70 gun on the Jagdpanzer IV Lang. The solution then was to replace the next pair of road wheels with steel rimmed ones. And indeed, by the time you get to the Jagdpanzer IV A, built by Alket, you're looking at half of the road wheels being steel rimmed and the other half being rubber rimmed. Return rollers. Well, there are four per side on most vehicles. However, by the time you got to the end of the production run, you're looking at only three per side. And this was because they were running out of roller bearings. Now, if you're strategic position is so bad that you got to cut back on return rollers just to save on roller bearings, you're obviously not in a very good position. The tracks, well, standard Panzer IV, single link, held in place by these little S-shaped cotter pins. The old technology you saw it on the Panzer I. 99 links per side, the system will cross a 2.2 meter trench and climb a 60 centimeter step. The side armor wasn't bad, it's three centimeters vertical for the lower hole and the casemate side is four centimeters sloped at 30. 
but the sleek rear paneling is just sheet armor and its function is to protect the air intakes which are back under here. This brings us now to the alternate position of the track stowage. Remember I mentioned that because of the nose heavy nature of the vehicle they moved the tracks from the front to the back. Thus this vehicle having the tracks on front and back is actually wrong. Now if you compare with the prototype vehicle you'll see that the road wheels, the spares, were originally mounted where the track goes. Well they had to be moved, they were moved to a position on the engine deck itself to the left hand side. When you started seeing steel rimmed wheels being applied to the lead bogies, what would usually happen is one of the spares would be steel and the other one would be rubber. As you go further down, there is the large horizontal muffler, the standard German type towing mount, and of course you can see how the track tension is done with this offset idler. Uh, lift up the lock, apply muscle power to the screw system. That's it for the back, now we start talking about the engine. If you had to look under the engine deck of a complete vehicle, you'll find one of these V12s. It's the Maybach HL120 TRM. And the name does mean something. If you'll forgive the mispronunciation and butchery which is about to follow, HL is Hochleistungsmotor, or High Performance Motor. The 120 refers to the 12 liters of displacement. TRM, God help me. Trockensumpfschmierung und Schnapper Magnet Sonder, or in slightly easier terminology, Dry Sump and Snap Magnetos. The engine is rated for about 265 horsepower at 2600 RPM in the standard Jaegpanzer IV and the 470V. When you get to the 470 Alpha, they've uprated it. It's now 272 at 2800 RPM. This all means that your standard Jaegpanzer IV will trundle along at 40 kilometers an hour forwards, five and a half backwards. When you get to the 470V, the speed drops down to 35 kilometers an hour, and when you go to the 470A, it comes back up again to 37 and a half. Now that I'm on top of the prototype vehicle, you can see a general view of the roof and the stowage of the tools, complete with the hand crank and the very large wrench, which I presume is for the track tension. Now on the regular Panzer IVs, with the exception of the very last variant, there is an auxiliary motor on the left hand side towards the rear, and that came with its own fuel tank. Well, there was no need for the auxiliary motor on the Jaegpanzer, so that was deleted and replaced by a conventional fuel tank, so there are three on the vehicle, the one at the left rear and the two further forward. Total capacity 470 liters will get the vehicle about 210 kilometers on the road. On the roof, you will see in between the commander and the loader's hatches, the port for the close-in defense weapon system, which is, I'm not even going to try to pronounce, I'm sorry. Now, a lot of vehicles were produced with simply this cover in place of the port because production of the weapon system was not up to production of everything else. Finally, further forward, you're going to see the arc through which the gunner's periscope will traverse. You basically need to have a slot in the whole roof. As the gun traverses, the periscope will traverse as well. So it's a simple system, but uh, perhaps a little bit more annoying than simply having a hole in the mountlet. Uh, of course, you want to keep the slot covered, so what you actually have is the periscope surrounded by a sliding sheet of metal, which will always keep the slot covered no matter which way the gun is traversed. Anyway, that brings us to an end of the exterior tour and part one. I'll see you at the next one, part two, when we go inside. Take care. Greetings, lads and lasses. All right, for those of you that haven't yet figured it out, Inside the Chieftain's Hatch was conceived as an advertising mechanism for World of Tanks, the game. And, well, it's uh, about time to verify whether or not this is actually working for the bean counters. So I know a lot of you don't yet play the game. Well, here's the thing, it's free to play. And if you look in the text description down underneath the video here, you're going to see some instructions on how to access the game and attribute the game to uh, these videos. And as I say, it's free, so give it a go, download it, 
look at the vehicles in the garage, hit the tech tree in preview, play a few games. If you don't like it, uninstall, no harm done, hasn't cost you a dime. If you do like it, well, congratulations, you found yourself a new time waster while you wait for part two of this vehicle to show up. See you there. Uh, the 120 refers to the 12 litres of displacement, and if you forgive the pronunciation, TRM is Trokum Schmeichsumpfschite. I'm not joking, it's Trokum Schmierung und Schnapper Magnet Sunder. My camera crew is pissing themselves laughing right now. HL is Hochluck. What is HL? Is Trocken Sumpf Schmierung und Magnet Schnapper. Or basic. Schnapper Magnet Sunder. <sighs> Jesus. We're gonna be here all day. <laughs> TRM, gotta help me. Trumpf Take 17. Ugh. <laughs> uh. I understand that German is a very simple language because it is very logical, but my god. Oh, we got the bloopers on this one. Trocken Sumpf Schmierung und Schnapper Magnet Sunder. Or if you prefer, Dry Sump and Snap Magnetos.